Welcome everyone. Today we are asking an important question, not of what can we do as Christians, but what should we do that puts our neighbor ahead of us? It's a tough question, but of course, St. Paul in his letters gives us some guidance on how we can follow Jesus so that he might increase and we might decrease ourselves. So yes, hello everyone. I am Pastor Tyson with Increase Decrease, your church at home source today, and it is an honor to be with you. I hope this is a blessing for you as we spend time in God's word, as we pray, as we praise him with our songs, and as we glean from him the wisdom that he gives to all of us. And so yes, today, if you would uh, benefit from this video, please consider liking and subscribing down below. It's one of those little things that helps you to see us each week, if you'd like to. And it also helps tell YouTube, hey, other people should see this. It actually has an impact, so I appreciate it every time you do it. Now, as we start our service today, we are going to begin reminding ourselves into which God we belong to. And that is, of course, the true God, the Trinitarian God. And so we start today in his name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we begin worship, we, we find a moment where we humble ourselves, where we go to God and say, God, it's not us to be perfect. It's not us to succeed in every way that you've called us to. Instead, it's for us to ask you for forgiveness. So I invite you to do that with me here by saying the words on your screen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our Father in heaven sent his son Jesus Christ to come and die so that you can be forgiven and he has died and risen. Your sins are forgiven. It is a glorious thing to hear that God does in fact not hold us so accountable that there is no forgiveness. Instead, he says, I have held you to account through Jesus. Walk with me today, hear my wisdom, and try again each day. So that is what we do as we follow our Lord as his forgiven people. Amen.
first reading is from 1 Corinthians, the eighth chapter. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. So as I started off this video, today the real question is not what can we do as Christians. It's not even what we can't do, it's what should we do in any given moment to be a blessing for our brothers and sisters and for unbelievers as well. It's a big question because it doesn't have any one answer. But of course we hear St. Paul in our reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 telling us a little bit how to think of this answer. How do we at least arrive there through our faith, through our heart and our mind, so that in any given moment when we are addressed with an issue that is unclear, well, we have some guidance from our Lord himself. And so let's go back, because in our reading, there are a lot of topics that don't make any sense today, but have huge impact as to how we can view our lives. See, St. Paul is writing to a, a new church, right? Back then, they were basically all new churches. Almost everyone was a new Christian, as far as you can think of it. And there was a new congregation full of probably new Christians, uh, maybe converted Jews, in the city of Corinth. And Corinth was in this, you know, the land that we now think of as Greece. And that's an important thing, because back then, there was a lot of belief in gods. They were very religious people back in the time of the Roman Empire, but there were so many gods that they became instrumental in your life. In fact, in the city of Corinth, if you wanted to hold a business meeting, the best place to go to it would be to go to one of the temples of the gods there and hold your business meeting there. That way the gods would bless it and you also get to have a good meal. See, because another thing that happened back then is almost all the meat that you could buy to eat in a city came from temple dedications to false gods, to Greek gods. And so really, these temples were a part of the community life. If you wanted to have someone over for dinner and have a nice roast, well, you got the meat from the market, which came from the temple. It had been dedicated to another god than our god. If you wanted to have a business meeting, you would go probably meet at the temple or eat food from there. Really, if you wanted to have a friendship, be a part of the society, have a business, be in politics, in some part your life was centered around these locations, these temples, to other gods. Now, if those are your gods and that's who you believe in as a Greek person, that makes complete sense. But what if you're a new Christian, surrounded by other Christians of varying levels of newness to the faith. Well, now there's a question. Should Christians eat at these places? But more importantly, should you even eat the meat that comes from the temples? Basically, should you become a vegetarian for the sake of your faith because none of the meat was a 
undedicated. All of it was dedicated to those other gods. And so Paul tells these Corinthians, here's how to think of this. This actually isn't a question of can you or can't you, right? The Bible does give us that. Can you murder people? No. Can you praise God? Yes, right? A lot of binary options like that. And he says this isn't one of them. Not, not really. Instead, the question is, should you eat that meat? See, it wasn't an issue of can or can't because, well, as Paul points out, those gods have no power. They're not real. The only power they have is over our hearts or, or over our convictions or minds or temptations. They're not, like, real to the point that if you eat food dedicated to them, they're going to take over your body or something. No, there's one God, and he is the only one. But it goes back to that. This meat still has religious significance, and it could have significant temptation to a new Christian who just converted from that faith. And so here's what Paul lays out. He lays out two types of Christians. One he calls knowledgeable, and the other he calls weak. And this is incredibly important. Paul is not, he is not, not talking about the faith of the person. Right? Paul and all of Scripture is really clear. You have faith or you don't. There is no such thing as weak faith in terms of do you have enough to believe or are you a better Christian or more saved? No. They're saved and unsaved. There's faith and not faith. There's believing and unbelieving. That's it. Instead, this idea of knowledgeable and weak Christians is referring to the understanding of does that Christian know that that meat is okay to eat? Or is that Christian weak in their understanding that it might be tempting to them or it might cause conflict? So really, here's Paul's worry. Hey, all you Christians hanging out together, all you people of faith, you got to live together. you got to be Christians together. And sometimes you might have a new brother who just came from the temple and converted and is saying, wait, wait, I don't want to partake in that. That reminds me of my past in a way that I'm not comfortable with. So he doesn't eat the meat. That's okay. But what about the guy who knows that meat does nothing? It's okay, I can eat the meat. God is one true God, right? Well, now Paul's saying, hey, you knowledgeable Christian, you know the truth of it. You're, you know that doesn't do anything to you. But if eating that meat in front of your brother who is worried about it hurts his faith or leads him to doubt, then it's pretty clear we shouldn't eat the meat sacrificed to idols. Not because we can't, but because we love our brother or our sister in faith. Obviously, Paul is more worried about how we as individuals choose to love and support our brothers and sisters. The topic is more about not being a stumbling block. Because think about this random Christian. He is strong in his knowledge. He knows that that meat does nothing to him. He could go to one dinner party, eat the meat with other Christians, and all of them are okay with it. And then the next day, he could go to another friend's house, a new Christian, and not eat the meat, knowing that it offends him. It changes based on who he is around and who he is currently caring for. Because for Paul, it's pretty simple. We care about souls because our Lord, our God, cares about souls. And so when we have a brother or a sister right in front of us, it makes us go, how do I care for this soul, this person, right here, right in front of me? And so how does that play out today? Well, I've never had meat offered to other gods. I've never even had to think about this. I think it shows up a lot, though. You know, what about alcohol? As Christians, we do get to drink alcohol within reason, within limits, right? The Bible says don't get drunk. But it says you can't have alcohol. In fact, communion, right? But what if talking about alcohol or drinking it around someone who is a recovering alcoholic would really offend or tempt them? Well, then in that case, Paul would say it's pretty clear. For the sake of them, now's not the time. What about a good, and I say specifically, a good conversation about politics or, or some other modern day issue, right? Where everyone is actually just sharing things. There's no animosity. But for some people, new Christians, that could be an issue. Or maybe just for some Christians who have been hurt recently, maybe it's not a thing to bring up and talk about. It's not illegal as far as our faith is concerned. It's just maybe not wise for them in that moment. Now, obviously, we can extend this to way more than those two issues. Because it's really not about the issues, it's about the person. And so here's the challenge you have, that I have, that we have to do every day. 
And this applies not just to other Christians, but to other people. How do we, in the moment, not be stumbling blocks for someone else to follow Jesus? And it could be on any topic. Maybe they were addicted to something other than alcohol. How does that play in? Maybe they were addicted to gambling on sports. Well, then maybe sports talk now goes out the window with that person because we don't want to offend them or cause them to trip up. It's hard because every single person has a new set of issues. Every single person has a new experience in life. It really comes down to how do I get to know and care about this person, this soul in front of me, as much as Jesus does. And now, obviously, we're never going to do it perfectly. We're not Jesus, which is why we start our time together and we start every morning going, God, forgive me. I got another day and I need you to be with me. I need your forgiveness. But as long as we have the heart, the guide of Jesus, right, to go out and go, I'm going to make an effort for this person right now to make sure they have nothing in their way that I have put there to Jesus. Nothing that I have put that could cause them to trip. That's our hope. That's our goal. And so I encourage you, when you run into someone, that person is a person that Paul, a person that Jesus, a person that we and you love. That is a soul that God wishes to save. And in that moment, it's for you to think, how can I love this person uniquely? By considering what they've gone through and considering what I can do, but maybe shouldn't. And when we have that heart, it's going to speak volumes to everyone not just about how much we care, but more importantly, about how much their God cares for them. And so go in peace, serve your Lord in this way, and God bless you because you are sharing the very love of Christ with everyone around you. Amen. And now I invite you, if you would please, let's take a moment and instead of just talking about God, let's talk to God in our prayers. Let's pray. Dear God, we are not perfect. We've already told you that today, and you know it full well. But what we do hope to have, Lord, is your heart, your love for every person, every soul we meet, just as we know you first loved us. And so, Lord, help us to decrease ourselves. Help us to increase the love of Christ that comes from us. Because we need your wisdom, and we need your guidance, and we need your forgiveness. Because every day there's a new fun challenge, a, a new opportunity, Lord, to love someone, to not get in the way of their faith, they're following you. And so, Lord, help us to have wisdom in those moments, to reduce ourselves where we must, to put aside our own freedom for the sake of others so that they can follow you just as we do. Lord, help us work together in this and lead us each day. Amen. And now if you would please join me and let's pray the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now we go out into the world, we go and meet other people, and we take the Lord's blessing with us into those interactions. And so let me remind you once more of the promise God gives to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. I hope it was a bit challenging. I know it is for me. Uh, we're going out into the world, we're carrying Christ with us, and we're bringing his love for them and for us as well. So go in peace, serve your Lord, and let's do it with joy. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Bye.